you get inside, huh? It's raining. We need the rain. Come on inside. Hello friends, welcome to my channel about creating and using hand spun yarn. This is my crafting channel about uh, my love of fiber, spinning, knitting, and sometimes weaving. So how are you today? Today is June 23rd, 2021, and I'm coming to you right outside of Chicago. I live in the southern uh, suburbs of Chicago, in, uh, right in the middle of the country. And today we have an unseasonably cloudy and cool day here in the Chicago area. So it's just lovely. Uh, there will be no noise from the air conditioning and I thought I would pop in and get a video recorded. So firstly, I wanted to thank everyone who reached out to me after my last podcast. I got such a warm welcome back. It gave me all the feels. I was uh, just thrilled to hear from you and I uh, was so happy that some of you enjoyed my very disorganized podcast last time. So um, I'm just amazed at the kindness of, of people that, uh, you know, that my viewers that are out there. And I thank you for being here. And um, so let's get this uh, show on the road here. So in today's episode, I uh, want to talk about my current knitting projects and I want to give you an update on my Icelandic breed study. I want to, uh, uh, I have a giveaway uh, a little bit later. Uh, I was kindly gifted um, something to give away on the podcast. So I will talk about that in a little bit. And got some spindle spinning and some books. I've just got a lot to talk about. So the first thing I wanted to share with you today is my cotton shawl that I uh, shared last week. So this is uh, my progress so far. So uh, yeah, it kind of is, it's not quite that orange, um, but it is, it's, it's pretty much that color. That's the reverse side, of course. <laughs> Here's the correct side. So, so this is kind of, yeah. So I think it's going to be beautiful with a black or white uh, shirt. So this is the tourmaline shawl by Jody Long, uh, made out of his Summer Delight uh, cashmere and. It's 90% cotton and 10% cashmere. So here's the yarn. I'll, I'll insert some photos here um, that give a better representation of the color. It's not quite this, this orange, but I haven't quite figured out this camera and how to um, manage the white balance. So, but uh, this is the, the yarn is called Summer Delight and the colorway is tomato, and it is a warm red, certainly. So this is a shawl that you start on the bottom, uh, you start, it's bottom up, it's the first shawl I've ever made in that way. You cast on 231 stitches, and then there's a 40 row lace chart. And it's the first lace I've ever done that has uh, patterning on both sides of the 
of the fabric. So, you know, for a lot of lace projects, you will just purl across on the wrong side. This one had a combination of, of knits and pearls, and uh, it really, you couldn't do this project without a chart. Um, so I learned a lot. I actually learned how to uh, fix a center double decrease in a row below. Um, you know, thank goodness for Google because um, I used two double pointed needles and I was able to maneuver the stitches so uh, to fix them. So, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of, this is my main project right now that I'm knitting. And what's really neat here is that now that the lace is done, all I have to do is do this garter pattern. Uh, what else did I want to say about this? I'm knitting it on one of my favorite needles. This is a uh, Chaogu size 5, US 5, 3.75. And let's see what else I want to say. Oh, I love the way it is decreasing. So you decrease every row. So one way you do a slip one, knit one pass, slip stitch over, and then on the back, on the reverse, you purl two together. So you're decreasing a stitch every row. And what's happening is the pattern is still being maintained. So this is the side where I'm doing my decreases. So now it's just knit all across and then knit an occasional purl on the back. And so uh, I'm focusing on this as my current knitting project. Another thing that's been taking up all of my time is my Icelandic breed study. So as some of you know, I have a, a, a several uh, small Icelandic lambs fleeces that I'm in the process of washing and pr uh, preparing. And my goal is to make a Lopa Pesa jumper and then also a cardigan with a zip. So um, what I have been doing is carding up my Icelandic uh, fleeces and I spun enough to make something. So here's my basket. Here's a, a cream color. This is a uh, lamb's fleece from Pure Joy Farms. I, I love their fleeces. It's a cream color. Then I have this brown from Woolly Woods Farm up in Boulder Junction, Wisconsin. And then I do have a little bit of black and some of this gray, but I didn't use that in my first project. So what does one do when it is 90 degrees outside in Chicago on a hot, humid day? You knit a Icelandic beanie, which is exactly what I did. So this is my hat that I made out of my first yarn. I'm really, I'm using this sort of as a swatch just to see how the yarn behaves. And I'll try it on for you. And actually, I'm so happy with this hat. <laughs> I'm not really a beanie person. I usually like more of a slouchy hat, but uh, for some reason, I just love this hat. Um, I. Uh, what did I do to make this? Oh, so I kind of did a hodgepodge of two patterns for this hat. I uh, cast on, I believe, 72 stitches. I'll grab my books here. So I cast on 72 stitches. I used I, uh, I figured that out from this uh, pattern that it's a free pattern on, on Ravelry. It's called the Bulky Waffle Hat. And I only use this for the numbers because my gauge was, was about the same as the bulky yarn. So what I did is I uh, cast on 72 stitches. Then I did a one by one rib for two inches with the cream. And I started on a five millimeter or US eight. And then I switched to a five and a half, which is a US nine for the first several rows of the brown. 
And then for this little color work pattern, I used a size 10 or six millimeter needle um, because uh, that was a suggestion that I, I don't know who said that, but if you go up a needle size for the color work, it, it can compensate for some of the tightness in there. So then after I finished the color work pattern, I went back to nine and I think I knitted for about seven inches. Yeah, I actually took notes, go figure. Yeah, so I did about seven inches, a knit brim to seven inches before doing the decreases. And then for the decreases, what I, I did is on the first round, I knit six, knit two together, then knit, then I knit, knit five, knit two together, knit, and, and so on, knit four, knit two together, knit, then three, then two, then uh, the last three rounds of the decreases were just knitting two all the way around. And I am really happy with the way the the top of the hat came out. It doesn't, it's not pointy. I don't like it when hats, oh, here comes the mailman. Um, I don't like it when the hats, you know, kind of point up. So this fits the, um, this fits the head quite nicely. And actually my husband wants to claim it. Um, it's quite soft, actually. Um, uh, the Icelandic yarn, Icelandic can be very uh, scratchy to many people because it has uh, tog fibers. I'll talk a little bit about tog and thel in a little bit. But the tog fibers can sometimes be bristly and they could stick out of the yarn and then it's itchy. And I find that the tighter you spin with the most more twist and the tighter you ply, the more scratchy it is because those tog fibers, which is the long outer coat of the fleece, um, they poke out. So that's why when I'm spinning, I'm spinning for a nice lofty, boy, it is really, really warm. Um, spinning for a nice lofty singles. And uh, so I'm gonna make a, a jumper uh, with the main body being the tan. And then um, I think the brown for the color work maybe kind of, I'll, I'll experiment because I've got lots of colors to work with. I got the pattern out of this book here, uh, Knitting with Icelandic Wool. It's sort of a, it's not the best of Lopi, but it, uh, it's got a lot of the main patterns. So the way I understand it is Lopi sweaters are all very similarly constructed and you can basically, as long as you've got the numbers, you can just switch out the yoke pattern. So you really don't need, you know, a million different patterns for the same sweater. And I made this, this is the, it's actually a child's hat. So, but I used the, I used the pattern here because this is done with let lopi with 80 stitches. And so, yeah, look at the little boy. <laughs> Isn't he cute? <laughs> so, yeah, I think a lot more, many more Icelandic hat patterns are, are in my, in my future. So uh, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is what I've learned about Icelandic fleeces. And my main resource that I'm using is this, this book by Elizabeth Abbott, uh, The Icelandic Fleece of Fiber for All Reasons. I have really taken a, you know, I've really read a lot of these uh, sections and I've learned a lot. Um, taken her suggestions, and then also from my own experience. So if you want to get more information about Icelandics, you can go to, um, I went to the Icelandic Sheep Breeders of North America and downloaded an information sheet. And I will link this uh, below in the description. And it goes through the Icelandic uh, sheep breed. Uh, just briefly, I'll, I'll summarize. So it's triple purpose, um, fiber, meat, and milk, a soft, lustrous, dual-coated fleece, a lustrous, soft pelt. So I actually have a, an Icelandic pelt behind me that I was going to show you. Many colors and pattern combinations medium-sized, early maturing, long-lived, excellent mothers and vigorous lambs, suitable for pasture lambing, and so forth. 
And the Icelandic sheep is one of the world's oldest and purest bread, breeds. For over a thousand years, they have provided fiber, meat, and milk. They are medium-sized, mature ewes in good condition, are 130 to 160 pounds, and rams are between 180 and 220 pounds. So both the ewes and the rams can have, pull, uh, can have horns or not. Uh, they're part of the northern European short-tailed family of sheep. They don't require their tails to be docked. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting about the Icelandics is they're not, they still have a lot of, of the feral qualities um, in them. They don't tend to flock very well and they tend to be very independent and they're not docile. I mean, I'm sure their personalities may vary. And the other neat thing about Icelandics is there's this con um, phenomenon of a leader sheep. So there were certain, there's certain sheeps of the, of the flock right, that sort of look out, they're sort of guard, they act sort of as a guard. And in Iceland, um, they, would, they, would, they could tell the weather, they could sense it. Have you ever heard the word bellwether? Well, that was a weathered uh, ram, so a castrated ram, and he had a bell. So, so that's the bellwether. Um, so they're really beautiful, um, beautiful colors. Um, let me show you this pelt here. And I, I picked this up at a home goods store, uh, you know, local to me. And uh, I mean, I'm not really like I don't have fur coats or anything, but um, they had a bunch of these pelts. Well, most of them were artificial, but they had this one. And this is an Icelandic. Uh, lambs uh, must it says I think on the back lamb skin uh, from Iceland and I got it for just a steal I think it was like I don't know fifty dollars or something um, so you could see how lustrous and, sh and beautiful it is I guess they don't have um, the number of follicles per square inch is less than say a merino or a fine wool um, but you know a very open fleece so yeah I have this on the back of my sofa in the winter I usually put it away for the summer but I just uh, yeah it's it's this very character you know characteristic the you can see the inside is the softer thal fibers it's a beautiful so I have some B-roll that I'm going to insert here of some of the fleeces that I have um, and how I am processing the fleeces. I'll show you the different colors and I'll be right back to continue with the podcast. I pulled out some fleece samples for you to look at here. So these are all Icelandic samples. You can see all the wonderful colors they come in. So let's start with the lightest. So there's a white, a white locks. It's a lamb's fleece. It's your white. Here's the black, pure jet black. Here's a gray with golden tips. These two samples here, this. Uh, brown and this cream are from the same fleece. It's a badger face ewe. Her name was Dolly and these fleeces are all from Pure Joy Farms with the exception of the last three which I'm going to show you. So this, so you get a cream color and a brown. This is a fleece from a shepherdess in Wisconsin. This was also a lamb's fleece. Uh, very uh, lots and lots of, of fell, the soft undercoat. Uh, I pulled out a longer lock to show you the structure, but most of the fleece looks like this. Very, very soft and silky tog. Here's another fleece from a uh, sample from the same shepherd in Wisconsin. So here's a couple of the locks I pulled out. And then here I wanted just to show you um, the variety of, of 
fleece types you can get into in one in one Icelandic fleece. You can see all those little those little curls. So this must have been around the uh, the neck and the top of the neck, which tends to be shorter and curlier. And then the last one I have is another black fleece. This fleece has an exceptionally long tag. So here is the lock, and it's this is uh, this is too long to put in my drum carter the way it is. Um, so as a matter of fact, which I, what I did is I pulled, I separated some of the tag fibers from the from the fleece, and I'll get a ruler here and show you. So this tag is about ten inches long from this fleece here. And then this is what I pulled out when I pulled out the the longer fibers. I have this cloud of short fluffy fibers which is the inner coat the fell. So I think there's a little bit of shorter tags in there but it's uh, extremely soft. And then this here is very, um, it's very strong and very silky. It could make a nice embroidery thread. This is a bag of Icelandic fleece. This is a fleece from Pure Joy Farms. This is, uh, her name was Dolly. And she was a badger faced you. She's mostly uh, cream color, and then she's got some brown. So I think uh, you know brown along the underbelly and around her face, I suppose. So there's a pretty brown here. So here I have some more laid out on my desk. She was two and a half pounds. I think uh, Katrina is very generous in her weighing because it's a lot of fleece. So here are some of the wash fleece I have laid out here. Um, here are some drum carded nests that I pulled off the drum carter through a diz. I was experimenting. Uh, I had marginal success with that, um, creating sort of a roving uh, from the drum carter. And so I'm going to uh, card up some more today and I thought I would take some video of the process. Here's the finished, some finished yarn I made from Dolly. So I made a, a, a bulky, heavy worsted to bulky singles yarn. And here's the project I made so far incorporating her. So this is an Icelandic hat I made from hand spun. So this cream color in the color work section and the ribbing is this yarn from that ball. I'm really happy with how it turned out. I was sort of winging it and uh, it fits very nice and tightly like a nice beanie should. So this is what your lock, here's a lock of her fleece. So all of this is very soft, fine lofty fiber at the base of the animal and then this is the longer curlier silkier tag. This is a fall lambs fleece. It was very clean and this one is carding up really nicely because it it's the tag is not exceptionally long and so I'm finding that I can pick it apart and create a pretty smooth bat. Uh, with another one of my fleeces I'm finding that I have to pull out the longest tag fibers before I I'll run it through the drum carter because you know you can't run like eight ten inches of uh, staple length through your drum carter. So I'm carting my Icelandic fleece here, and when I first started carting, I was very carefully uh, pulling out locks from the tip end. You know, and I try to pull it out very carefully. And I was very carefully teasing out the fell. But now what I'm doing is I'm just grabbing a clump and I'm just teasing it apart with my hands like this. You know, much like a picker would do at a mill. Just 
just picking it apart, uh, checking for any veg matter. Like here's a little seed, pull that out. And so I got all this fluff here. And then in small quantities, uh, feeding it through the drum carter. And then take a little bit more clouds of fiber, just a small amount. Less is more when you're carding. I know I, I tend to want to load it in too much because I'm impatient and I want my bat to be done right away. But um, I'm going slowly. I just hold it down. And I'll run this through three times to get a pretty well blended bath. one pass. That's one pass through the carter. It's actually it's actually pretty smooth. I think this one's only gonna take um, this is only gonna take two passes. So isn't that pure pretty? <laughs> this is just beautiful. A pillow of fiber. So let me show you a couple of the fiber bats that I've made. Uh, from the fleeces. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's so soft. It's so soft. Um, but what I found is that if you, if you spin this too tightly or you spin it in, um, you know, a traditional like short forward, you're going to get a nice strong yarn, but it's going to feel like twiny and ropey. Will, I, I mean, I think if you are really painstaking, and pull out the majority of the tag fibers, you could get a very fine yarn. I just don't have the patience for that. And what I read in the book was that, um, much like Shetlands, they will, sh they will shed their fleece. And so they think that the, the samples they have in the museums, uh, the textile museums, the really fine, fine um, items from the, from the fell, that they were, were able to pluck the fell from the animal before it lost the tag. So it would molt, you know, it would shed the fell, and then later it would shed the tag. And so you could separate the two and get a very fine yarn like that. So those Icelanders must be um, made of very sturdy stuff, I must say. So here's, each of these bats is about 50 grams. I think I could push my uh, Clemens Carter a little harder um, but uh, 50, 50 grams is fine. Uh, I think one of these is 70. I weighed it. Um, you know, so this is the gray, and then here I've got white. So yeah, I'm just having a ton of fun.
happens when I see you I feel the rush out of the blue out of the blue so don't let go you bring me very fluffy and um, you can see it's very very loosely spun and when I take it off um, onto the knitting knot I have to be super careful because it can break almost like uh, Plutolope can break because uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of twist holding it together and then once you wash the yarn it's uh, slightly felt and it'll have a, a lot more uh, integrity in the knitting so how about you guys? Have you ever spun Icelandic into a Lopi style single, a singles yarn? I'd love to hear your experiences. So I wanted to show you how, um, how you can measure your yarn. So um, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, measure your yarn if you want to be technical, I guess. Uh, one of them is called wraps per inch. And wraps per inch is simply uh, the number of times that the singles, or your finished yarn, uh, wraps around an inch on a ruler or a device like this. So this is a, uh, this is from Nancy's, this is from Nancy's Knickknacks um, wraps per inch a knit card uh, toolkit that I, that I bought a while ago. And it's got markings on here, I think you can see. Uh, it's got three inches here. It's one, two, three inches, yeah. And so what you do is you take a sample of your yarn. You can you don't you don't need the special tool. You can use a ruler as well. And but this is nice because it's got a little notch here that you can kind of secure your yarn. All right, now I have this attached, which is a slightly problematic, but I just don't want to separate the two. Okay, and then what you do is you uh, roll the yarn around the, the uh, ruler or the device. You, you, um, you, they say you don't want to wrap it around with your hand because you might be adding or subtracting twist. So I guess the proper way to do it is to roll your device around your yarn. Let me pull this off here. Oops, see how strong see how strong Icelandic is <laughs> it's pretty strong all right so I'm so slick so what you're gonna do is you're gonna roll it 
and they say to do it so it's sort of, I don't know, it's kind of tricky, I think. Um, I've got three wraps so far. And there's four. There's five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Keep going. And you can go one inch. Now, I guess you're supposed to leave, you're not supposed to pack it like super, super tight on there. You're supposed to sort of let them just be adjacent to one another. So I'm going to count how many wraps I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm getting seven wraps per inch around the tool. And if you want, you can continue to roll and maybe get it kind of like gauge in knitting. You, you want to test it out over a larger area. You can actually keep rolling until you get to uh, the two inch mark. And again, just kind of let them sit next to each other. I find this to be very fiddly. But it's uh, information about your yarn. So, um, Also, if it's fluffy, you probably should leave a little bit of room in between. So, so now I'm going to count here. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then, of course, you can... I can squeeze one more wrap on there to convince myself that it's seven wraps per inch. <laughs> so that's uh, one way. And so seven wraps per inch is heavy worsted to bulky. And then six wraps and fewer is bulky. So I think Alifos Lopi, the original, is um, measured to be seven wraps per inch on Ravelry. So the other way that you can measure your yarn. Now I gotta take this off of here. Is to use a spinner's control card. So this one is laser engraved. Uh, seven wraps per inch all the way to 60 wraps per inch. And then what you can do is you can take different samples of your yarn and lay it along laid along the the markings and so uh, there's my seven wrap sprint. Sometimes I put it underneath so I could see it a little better. So there's my seven wraps per inch. But see so it's really sometimes it's a range. I mean here's the very fluffy part which is probably a little fewer than seven wraps per inch. And then here's the little bit thinner spots that looks to be about eight wraps per inch. So I think you're going to have, you know, especially with hand spun, you'll just have a, uh, you might have a little bit of variation. But in the knitting, it all tends to work out. So, yeah, this one I got off of a shop on Etsy. I really like this one, but I have another one that's plastic and it's transparent, which is also very nice. So how about you? Have you ever worked with Icelandic before? I, uh, my, the yarn that I am spinning up is way softer than Lopi. I have some Lopi somewhere in my stash. I can't uh, locate it at the moment, but um, my hand spun is way, way softer. I think that's a couple of things. First of all, I'm hand processing, and you know, it's not, and also I'm using lamb's wool as opposed to adult fleeces. So that may be making a big difference in the softness factor. Mm. Right, so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is my spindle spinning project. So I was inspired to, to get out my spindles. Um, well, I always sp spindle spin in the summer uh, because I'm kind of, it's just nice to walk around and be outside and have the portability of it. Um, but I was kind of encouraged to uh, delve into the spindle spinning some more because of the spindle spun summer. Uh, make along that I think Mars of the Hey Brownberry podcast uh, came up with, and Rachel and uh, Mars are hosting this. I'm not part of the official make along or anything like that, um, but I am um, hashtagging my spindle projects, spindle spun summer, so you could do the same thing. And I have a little B roll here that I took a little bit earlier today uh, showing you that spindle project, and I'll insert that right here.
So I found this spindle project in a basket. It was all disorganized. It is um, spindle spun little mini skeins I did on a Turkish spindles. And it was from a pack of Ingle Nook. A fiber some years ago. And it was just, isn't it cute? So, so yeah, I have the one, two, three, four, five. I have six of the mini skeins, and then here's some unspun fiber, all naturally dyed. And then here's one that I'm currently working on. I think this was dyed with logwood, some, some purple, so I had to uh, fluff it up quite a bit and pull it into strips to spin. So I was thinking, oh and then here are all the little balls that are in progress. So here we're, I just uh, neatened them up here. So I'm going to have to figure out how to ply these. Aren't they pretty though? So what I was thinking of doing is, uh, this is some natural spindle spun yarn I have. This is uh, a Ram Rambouillet BFL cross sample. Uh, these are two uh, spindle spun uh, fin samples, fin cheap, very soft. Here are two... Um, Jacob lamb spindle spun samples. So I have these natural colors and I was thinking I want to do a project with these uh, maybe like a color work cowl or scarf. I also found some little bitty samples from sometimes when you buy a yarn from a dyer they'll send you a little sample. So this is from Corgi Hill Farm. This is a merino silk alpaca. Here's another um, Ingle Nook Fibers little sample. Here's Peaches. Hey Peaches, are you keeping me company on the floor here? Yeah. And then I have, this is another sample from Mother Macrina, and yet another little sample. I don't know what the fiber content of these is, but I thought maybe I would spin the little samples up too. And I also found this lavender. Um, I dyed with acid dyes. I dyed some locks and and spun. This is the same as this. So I don't know if I would use that with the naturally dyed ones, though. I think I want to just we we'll just do the natural dyed ones with maybe just some natural color fleece. What do you think? So, um, spindle spun summer. I do tend to do a lot more spindle spinning in the summer. So, uh, Mars and Rachel from Woolen Spinning are hosting a spindle spun summer make along. So, I thought I would pull this project out uh, and finish it up. I thought I would just share it with you here. So they're very textured because the fiber content had lots of different types of fiber in them. So, you know, you're not going to get a real smooth and consistent yarn. This one looks pretty consistent. So, yeah, I was happy they were in a mess. I, I'm embarrassed to say they were just stuffed in a basket. So, one more look at my girl. Hey, girly.
I wanted to talk about two more things. So I have a giveaway. So I was contacted by uh, a lovely gal. Uh, she's Peruvian. She's, she's, she lives in the States. And she reached out to me and asked me if I was interested in giving away uh, some of her yarn that she sells in her shop. So um, the lady's name is, is Heidi. And on Instagram, she's alpa uh, Alpaca uh, Vinchos, V-I-N-C-H-O-S. I'll, uh, I'll put it right here below. And I'm just going to read you a little excerpt from her letter. And um, she also sent me some photographs and a little short video clip of some women spinning uh, alpaca in Peru. So I'll insert that here as well. But she wrote, I am from Peru, but I moved to the U.S. in 01. Um, she's taking classes here, and she's uh, staying in the country, but she wants to help the alpaca growers in her native country, Peru. As you know, in Peru, there exists large numbers of alpacas, the largest number of alpacas in the whole world, but they are much more than only alpacas. There are 100,000 families that are alpaca growers that live in extreme poverty. So she has decided to help and support alpaca growers, indigenous communities in Peru. And she lists some other locations as well. And she says the alpaca communities in Peru really need help. They do not get any pandemic health, any unemployment, no loans with low rates. It's sad. And so she, um, she has a shop, which I will link below, where she, uh, she buys their hand-spun alpaca yarn and sells it in her shop. And she also imports other items, accessories to the U.S. and then sells them. And then she uh, takes some of the, she uh, sends the, the, the funds back to the ladies there. So I wanted to show you what she, uh, what she donated to the podcast. And then I also made a small purchase that I'm going to throw in with the giveaway. So this is uh, some hand-spun alpaca. It, it, I didn't take it apart. It's very, very tightly uh, hanked. It's very soft. It's a creamy color uh, with little brown flecks. I believe it's a two-ply. It's very, very soft. I think this would make a beautiful lace shawl. It would be beautiful in weaving. I'm not sure how many yards it is. Um, but it's just really, really lovely. If I, I get the yardage and the, the weight here, and I'll, I'll put it down below right here. So she sent this to us so that uh, we, could, we could give it away to one of you lovely viewers. So, so that's up for a giveaway. And then I went in and had a little look at her shop. Oh, she, here it is. It's Lace Weight. It's Lace Baby Alpaca. It's 4.75 ounces, and she estimated it to be 200 yards. And then I also purchased this cute little embroidered pouch. Here, this is the top. It's just really cute. So I purchased this, and what I would like to do is I would like to put these two items together as a giveaway, sort of, I mean, we could call it a 5,000 subscriber giveaway. Um, if you like, um, but all you have to do to win this is make a comment below. And then I will use YouTube's random name selector. And then in two weeks time, when I come back on, I will um, announce the winner and I will get this off to you. So uh, she just sounds like she's doing really good work. And uh, we, we, uh, I strongly encourage you to go check out her shop. And if there's something in there that looks, um, you know, looks attractive to you, you might make a purchase to support the Peruvian uh, growers of alpaca. Also got another gift. I got a gift this week. This is something that's really exotic. <laughs> Do I have your attention? So one of my wonderful viewers, who's in Alberta, Canada, sent me some kiviet. Kiviet is a fiber from the musk ox. 
so uh, what they do is they they um, harvest the downy fibers from the musk ox. I don't know how they do it. They must get them in some sort of pen. And so she said, hey, I would love to send you some of this fiber. Sorry for the crinkling. So she sent me this. <laughs> it's peeled right off the animal. So this is, it almost looks like it's a pelt, doesn't it? But this is just the, the skin of the animal. And this is uh, kiviat. Now, what you're going to have here is you're going to have two types of fibers. <laughs> Again, animals, in order to stay warm, they have two, two coats. So you're going to have the real soft downy fibers and then the guard hairs. You can see, I can see one poking out right here. All right. So I'm not sure how I am going to process this. Um, maybe pluck it away and then uh, use my... Luet super, super fine mini combs to try to, um, you know, get the fiber out of here. But um, if any of you have ever worked with this before, I'd love your suggestions. But what you can do is you could just pull it off. It's very short and downy. And here's, here's. The and I think what I'm going to do is I am going to spin uh, support spindle this. Because what I read about Kiviet is that if you spin it in extremely fine yarn and make a very gossamer cowl, it will keep you incredibly warm. So thank you uh, for sending this to me. Um, I really appreciate it. And then she also sent, I guess when she was at the musk ox farm, she bought some prepared Kiviet, and so she blended it into this uh, bat. It's a super fine, um, super fine merino uh, blended with the Kiviet, combed Kiviet that she had purchased at the at the shop. So I'm going to start uh, spinning this. I think again, I think I'm going to use my support spindles for this, but I'm really excited about trying this precious fiber. Uh, it's very, very expensive. So I really appreciate that you, you sent this to me. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just lovely, to, lovely to get. It does smell, it smells like a musk ox, I guess. <laughs> so what else? Um, I'm going to have all kinds of fiber on me. So what else have I been up to? Let me just check my check my notes here. Um, yeah, so I've just been having a lot of fun uh, with uh, with prepping fiber and washing fleeces, and you know it is it is work. Um, it's not, but it's it's fun. It's fun work. So I wanted to show you uh, this, this bat that I made. So I have this bag of, I call it combing waste, but it, what it is is it's all fiber that's re re reasonably clean, but maybe came off the combs during a combing process or it you know, got caught on the liquor in and wasn't included in a bat. So I'm just kind of like throwing it into this bag and just kind of saving it for some, I don't know, maybe I'll start needle felting or something. So what I did is I pulled out some of the fiber from my combing waste bag and I made this really funky bat. It's it's super textured and neppy. Uh, it looks kind of like uh, looks like uh, cotton candy. And I'm spinning it here into this really cute yarn. I'm just I'm just having fun. And this is a, a spindle from IST Ian Tate from the Isle of Wight who makes fantastic Turkish spindles if you can get a hold of them. Spinning has just taken off and I mean it's hard to get a hold of some things and fiber tools and wheels and stuff are getting really kind of pricey. Um, but yeah, so that's that's a spindle pro a project I'm working on and it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. 
yeah, I think I think that's about it for today. Um, I did want to close by uh, giving you a couple of podcast suggestions. I'm always on the lookout for fiber podcasts that are, um, you know, engaging and fun to watch while I'm knitting or spinning. And I found a few of them that I thought I would share with you today. And please, if you know of any others that I didn't mention, if you could uh, put them in the comments below, uh, we would really appreciate it because a lot of us spinners really get inspired by watching other people, um, you know, work with fiber. So I want to mention a few of them that I, I've been watching. So. Uh, one of them is called My Fiber Journey, and this is my friend Sherry. I've known for now many years now through Instagram, though we've never met in person. She has a lovely podcast where she shares her um, her fiber work. She's an art yarn spinner. She's oh, she does amazing rug hooking, like amazing work. Her name is Sherry, and it's My Fiber Journey. Uh, the other one, a uh, couple more, being youthful. Um, Fiber Farm and Mill. Uh, her name is Kim Beagler, I think. She's in Oregon, and she runs a fiber mill. And she really talks a lot about wool. And she, her, one of the things she always says in her podcast is wool is not generic. And she'll often show various locks of different kinds of, uh, kinds of fleeces. And she talks about knowing your wool, and she talks about sustainability and so on. Now, her pot, she's just lovely. I, I've really been enjoying her podcast. Another one is Tamson Judy. She's also a Canadian. Uh, Tamson has a channel called BF Fiber Arts Creations, and she's a hoot. I mean, she is so fun. Um, she she gets so excited. Um, she shares. She pops in with short videos of her spinning or box opening. Uh, she did a whole a tutorial on lock spinning, tail spinning, which is uh, amazing. She's now spinning um, flax. And she has some of her episodes, she'll, be sp she'll spin and then she'll read a story to you while she's spinning. She's just a lot of fun. So that's, again, that's Tamsin Judy, uh, BF Fiber Arts Creations. I think she has a shop, too, where she sells hand-dyed yarn but, and fiber, but I'm not sure. Um, another one is Liz from Pyramid Knits Podcast. She's a sewist, uh, knitter, spinner, and natural dyer. I believe she is in New Mexico, and she's also very, very genuine and funny, and uh, she's been uh, just spinning, I think, she picked up spinning in the last year, and she really makes some amazing things, and she also has an online shop. And then finally, uh, Kim at Fairly Fiber Fun. So Kim is has her own business where she sells fleeces and fiber, and her channel's really lovely. She does a lot of spinning, uh, carding, uh, preparing wool, and uh, she's really awesome too. So if you can think of any other podcasts um, that you think uh, our viewers might be interested in, in watching or checking out, or if I didn't mention you today, um, you know, please let me know if you have a channel and I'll check you out. And um, you know, we're, always, we're always wanting to support each other um, you know, in our, in our video casting uh, forays. It's not, not the easiest uh, thing to do in the world is to get in front of a camera and just you know, talk, to your, talk to yourself, but we know I'm talking to you. So I think that's it for today. Um, I hope you're well. I hope you're having a good summer. And I hope you're having some time to do lots of fibery, uh, crafty things. So uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, until then, please leave a comment below. Uh, if you want to enter the giveaway, uh, email me at soulfulspinning at gmail.com. Or I'm pretty active on Instagram. You can PM me there at Instagram. I'm the Soulful Spinner. Uh, we do have a Ravelry group. I have to say Ravelry. I go there for patterns and that's about it. Um, I don't always engage in the community forums as much as I would like. Um, looking down the line, um, when I get more time to build the channel, it might be fun to create maybe a Discord group. I'm looking into that. If you know anything about Discord, let me know. Um, it's just a way for people to, to chat and to communicate. 
So um, yeah, so that's about it for today. Um, thank you so much for spending some time out of your day uh, listening to me ramble on about my fibery adventures. I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.